Femigoggery. Uh, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. This is uh, Benjamin Boyce, and welcome to a live stream with Stella O'Malley and Kelly J. Keene, alias The Posey Parker. Thank you very much. These are two of the most admirable women that I've come across in my time studying and, and uh, investigating the gender topic broadly. Um, but you're both kind of oriented in different ways and operative in different domains and sometimes those domains overlap and that might be what we get into today but you two want to say hi and tell us what you hope for from this wonderful thanksgiving conversation i go first okay so uh hi um uh, what i hope comes from this conversation is a further understanding of each other's position and some clarity in maybe what some of the objections might be from either side uh and the general conversation and maybe that, that then you can we can put some of the issues to bed uh because oh. i think that they're not helpful for anybody that's what i think amen um i welcome that i'm kind of thrilled to start on this tone because I, I very much want the same thing. I, I've admired Kelly J ever since I've met her. I think her work is brilliant. And I think Let Women Speak is an amazing uh, campaign. And I have t-shirts, my kids have t-shirts and my sister has t-shirts all from Kelly J. And I certainly tried to get a billboard going in Dublin a few years ago because I think the billboard campaign is probably the best of, of all the many campaigns. So I, I, I think what Let Women Speak do is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I think actually uh, what Jen Specs also does is very good and very worthwhile. I think it's very different. I think there's been an extraordinary level of misrepresentation of my work and me. And it began when I did that film in 2018 called Trans Kids, It's Time to Talk. And it's been a, a very concerted smear campaign from people who are, um, I don't know if they're supporters of Kelly J or certainly they seem to be supporters of Kelly J, but they, the, 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 the extraordinary purposeful determination to misrepresent my work. I used to be always told, I'm still always told to ignore it and carry on, but it hasn't worked. I'm five years in and an awful lot of people think things about me and my work and Jen Speck, that is wrong. It's, it's fundamentally wrong and would take, frankly, five minutes or 10 minutes online to find out if it's right or wrong. So it, it's very easily verified everything that I'm accused of. So I'd love to get the opportunity to, to say what I stand for, what Jen Speck stands for, which is, you know, not, a, not the same thing. And um, I'd love if we left this conversation with, with some sort of level of clarity of let women speak what they do. Isn't it brilliant? Genspect what they do. Hasn't it got worth and merit? And off we went. Like, to me, that would be a really good result because I think this is a mass, gender ideology is a massive, massive movement that needs, and needs a thousand organizations. It's got probably 500. It needs many more. And I think there's space for every one of us. So this, uh, you both are in a position of garnering a lot of negative attention, negative press, and from the same quarters, like there, there, there's a very concerted effort to push trans ideology, trans medicalization, and the uh, erosion of boundaries around the definition of woman and women's spaces, and so on and so forth. So there's a common enemy, but there's also like tensions within this common allyship it's maybe not even an allyship because it's never there's no treaties there's nobody who signs treaties and say we're going to do this to accomplish this goal so we're always kind of in a discourse of kind of defending ourselves from from a external or common enemy and that common enemy is putting us on our toes a lot and i see from kelly J. Keene's kind of side or, or the the women that you platform and interact with that uh, not your side. I don't know how to speak about it, but the people who congregate around you have uh, they're kind of on edge a lot because there's so much 
just terrible behavior coming from the trans rights activists. And you guys are getting, I mean, you yourself, Kelly, are getting smeared like with like, literally with tomato soup and, and attacked and assaulted and stuff. So there is kind of this, people are kind of on their toes a lot. And I don't know to what extent that, that anxiety is kind of pushed inward to people who are closer to us because we can actually engage with people who are on our side because the people on our side are even saying like they're they're not the no debate crow crowd so there is lines of communication um i don't know if that necessarily makes much sense but kelly what do you think the issue is okay um you frozen or if you are you just pausing ben i can't tell i'm just pausing uh, yeah <laughs> So, just right, <laughs> this is what I think. I'm just going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to be plain speaking because why would I do anything else? Women have an expectation because they've been let down so badly and detransitioners and anyone involved in this cult and anyone silenced and anyone in the parenting group and they've been silenced and they've been treated so appallingly by the wider society. And I think for most of the women, not the kind of, not the activists, not women that have been in the trenches in feminism for years, but normal women have been so shocked and dismayed that actually they really are not listened to at all and they're not taken seriously. And this issue has brought that about. That I think when Gen Spect came about, from what I can gather from, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about, I'll, I'll just, I'll, let me just address the fact that you said Kelly J's and you use me. It wasn't just me. <laughs> that objected to what people perceived, and many people, I saw it, I was really quite shocked. The treatment of Debbie Hayton's wife on camera, uh, where she is, she has an inability to speak, she's stuttering over her words. And I think you have maintained, uh, Stella, you've maintained a view of Hayton, which I think has been naive, maybe it's changed over the years, but uh, sort of forgiving him for his gaslighting and abuse of his wife and family. And I've seen you repeatedly defend him online. And I think that what that does is it puts people in a position where they think when it comes to crucial kind of signs of abuse, can they trust you? And I think that that is an incoherent message in comparison to the incredible work. And I know families who've worked with you and, and they absolutely think that you have saved their families' lives and their children, you've saved them from catastrophic transition and my god i i i wish that that element of the things that you do so well sort of extended right across but i think there is an incoherence between trying to understand an agp which i think you should do from a therapeutic level if your patient has got agp i think it's absolutely right that you have an understanding of that but on that television program i think hayton was given uh far too easy a ride I found it as a as a woman, I, I found myself watching a traumatized, abused woman on camera. And I don't I, it doesn't really matter how else that's sort of played or interpreted or whatever. I think we all know what we saw. And I think you saying well done, I think really hurt a lot of women who've been victims of abuse. And I think that the sort of parting comments of, well, you know, maybe some kids should transition, which I know you don't believe. I think that also added incoherence because I think your fundamental goal and what you want to do, I think is absolutely admirable. And by God, I hope you achieve it. I hope you replace WPATH. I hope that happens. But I just feel when something as public as that AGP comes to your conference and then he sort of put online, which he didn't need to be put online, but he was. And in fact, him being there at all and it being okay for him to be there is incoherent. And therefore, I think people lose trust. So I think that's that's what I want to address. Just just for clarity, so Kelly, you brought up a program called Trans Kids. It's time to talk, or another BBC yeah. program. Yeah. When did that air? Yes, oh, sure. twenty eighteen. It actually aired this week. I think today, in twenty eighteen. Oh. There we go. Now everybody's frozen. <laughs> no, we're good. There's yeah, just a too. bit of a delay. So Stella, what your response? Yeah, um, I'm just making sure that I've 
I'm uh, on. Yeah, I have a few responses, and I'm actually really glad, Kelly J, that I've the spirit of this because I, I'm so relieved, I'll be honest, because I was afraid this was going to be combative. I'm all for plain thinking and planes talking very much. Um, in 2018, when I was doing that film, I was. Uh, uh, I certainly knew a hell of a lot less than I know now. And I was I was employed to be a greenhorn. I was a psychotherapist coming in to a film who did not know much about gender, who had her own experience as a kid and who was all about mental health. That's what I that's why I was a presenter. They could have chosen, you know, Stephanie Davis arrived. She would have been a genius, but she knew everything and they did not want somebody like that. They could have chosen Heather Brunskill Evans for the same reason they were vetoed. They wanted somebody who didn't have any preconceptions, any knowledge of trans issues, just her own experience as a, a gender distressed kid, which is what I was. And so I, when I interviewed Debbie Hayden, you're right, I did definitely give Debbie Hayden an easy ride. I didn't know what autogynophilia was. I'd never actually heard the word. After that interview, I know exactly where I was when I f first heard the word autogynophilia. I was in the kitchen of James Caspian, who is a psychotherapist. And, you know, there's a, there's a kind of a cascade of kind of dominoes that fall when you hear autogynophilia and you go, and I remember it, he was bending over his kettle and I was like, oh, right. And so much kind of realization of what the implications of the concept of autogynophilia registered in that kitchen. This was after my interview with Debbie Hayton and there was no opportunity to go back and do another interview. The sole reason why we had Debbie Hayton on the uh, show you know, there was no real reason to have a middle aged mid trans person on that show. It was all about trans kids and should trans kids medicalize. And the reason why we had tr Debbie Hayton on the show was uh, to show a trans person who actually agreed with our position. Number one, I wanted and so did the director and so did, funnily enough, the, the, the Hayton family wanted to include the pain of the family. That was a very definite um, uh not only an editing, but a producing kind of decision that the pain of medical transition needs to be highlighted and very heavily demonstrated. Now, we did hours of footage that day. There was so many points we could have done after a trans woman criticizing um, medical transition of, of children and gender ideology. We didn't go for it. What we went for was the pain of the family. It was an extraordinary day. The pain that Stephanie showed w was was really awful. Me saying well done, I really want to take up on that point. We all have verbal tics. I have a few verbal tics. Well done is one of them. That when somebody is speaking, I'm a therapist. I go into this kind of, that's right. Yeah, good point. Good for you. Well done. I say, it, I, I wish it wasn't said in that context because now I know it's being presented as if I was saying, well done for sacrificing your family. I wasn't saying that. I was seeing the pain of the woman and I could see she made decisions on behalf of her family that she thought was the right thing. And I was just solidarity from one woman to another kind of going, I can see what you went through. I hear you. Good for you. I just, you know, you did what you needed to do. And I felt very strongly in tune with her and I still feel strongly in tune with her. If she's been abused, I don't know. I think we, I'd be very reluctant to kind of say if, if a person says they're not being abused, if a person says, and I've known them for some years and they've consistently said that they're not being abused. I think I, I wouldn't, I'd be very reluctant to kind of superimpose my own views on that. I do think when I said that, uh, again, not knowing the heat and the controversy of every statement I said, that was a stupid line. It was, it was, you know, when you're you're trying to say something for TV and you're saying, well, that's an argument that some children should medical transition. That is the only time in the whole five years that I have worked in this that I have on any level. So one sentence out of I am talking about tens of thousands of sentences that I have on any level said that children should medically transition. And it was not to say that it was to highlight the pain of this transition on that family. I wasn't saying it. It was a rhetorical question. I wasn't saying it that children should medically transition. The entire film, the entire work 
of that film was to say children shouldn't medically transition. I've never deviated from it. I've never changed from that line. I've always consistently said children shouldn't medically transition. I asked a rhetorical question just to highlight middle age transition on a family is profoundly inappropriate on their children, on the wife, on everybody involved. That was a devastated scenario that I was watching and I needed to kind of highlight it. I used a rhetorical device. I wish I didn't. There's quite a few sentences. There's one sentence that, frankly, you should probably crucify me. <laughs> I'll invite you to, which is I said, and I, 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 there was war over it and they told me they'd take out this line and they didn't take it out. There was war over the production of this. This film took months and months of war of uh, that line is in, that line is out. And the day before I, I the film came out, it came out, I think, on a Wednesday. I was brought to Dublin and I left the studio in tears and I thought the film wasn't going to go out because I wouldn't say the line that they wanted me to say. They were telling me to say this line. I wouldn't say this line. They said the film won't go out unless you say this line. They wanted to give me a, a, a definition of gender dysphoria as per the NHS. I said, I won't give it. They said, this is a UK film. I said, I'm using the DSM because that's the good definition. They said, you have to use the NHS. I said, I won't. And I left. So some, some, some battles in that film I won. Some battles I lost, some battles I didn't even know existed. I didn't know what autogynephilia was. I should have, but I should I have, because arguably the whole point of the film was that to know I was somebody on a, a voyage of education and I certainly became very well educated by the end of it. But to finish, the line that I think you could try to crucify me on was, I said something like, there's voices inside the building. I still cringe whenever I hear it. I'm probably giving material to everybody to shoot me on, but there we go. Voices inside the building, the voices outside the building, and nobody is listening. And I remember at the time I said, no, I shouldn't say that. That's not right, because the women were speaking. The people outside, this is in Bristol, the people outside are being absolutely uh, egregiously violent and, and um, abusive. And they said, we won't put in that one. And I recorded another line and they did put it in. And I was like, that ah, dirty tricks, you know, but it happens in television. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, you know, these things happen in television. What I want to point out is that that film was the first film that ever platformed, uh, mainstream film that platformed a detransitioner. It was the first ever film that platformed a detransitioner. The detransitioner said her genitalia had grown and it looked, her clitoris looked like a micro penis. It was a jaw dropping moment on mainstream TV. It was on Channel 4, it was on at something like nine or 10 o'clock. It was really like, you take in an intake of breath. Another part of that film, there was a 12 year old who was almost mute, who was autistic, who was living in his room. And the parent downstairs was in an awful state, kind of agonizing. The child was on puberty blockers, profoundly autistic, saying, maybe my child is going to regret it. Maybe my child is one day going to say, I was a child, you should never have put me on puberty blockers. It's a powerful moment in the film, ignored. The, the, the detransitioner talking about her, her genitalia, ignored. The women in Bristol, that gets a bit, but by a billion miles, the most uh, viewed clip of that film is frankly what I would consider a very irrelevant piece of the film, which was um, my pretty basic interview. It was the first interview, as far as I could recall, uh, with uh, Debbie Hayton and Debbie Hayton's uh, wife, uh, Stephanie, where I ask a few crass questions. It's not, it, it was such an unimportant part of the film. It was basically, look, medical transition causes profound pain to the family. That's the caption of that scene. Anyway, let's move on to the good stuff. The detransitioner, the 12 year old, Bristol and those women being stopped. They were really, then the shocking interviews with these trans men who were guinea pigs and who admit that they were guinea pigs. There was some really good stuff and it felt very bad faith for people to keep on going on about what really wasn't the point of the film. The point of the film was trans kids. Should children medicalize? Children are in uh, different countries like America. They're having mastectomies at 13 and 14. Kids are going on puberty blockers. They're having no sexual development. You know, yes, women are being abused all over the world. It's not the focus of that film. It was not the focus of the film and it wasn't something that I was aware of. It wasn't something I was educated in and I have since been educated in. And I do cringe when I watch that clip but I do think when somebody makes a mistake I look at their body I look at the body of their work so I look at the whole film and say 
Well, in fairness, that was just one part of it. The very same with a tweet. If somebody puts out a tweet, I'll flick onto their account and look at the general work. And if they're continuously making the same thing, I might say something. But if it's a, a kind of an off, uh, inappropriate tweet among many, many appropriate tweets, I'm not going to criticise them. So I, I do think that's a, an, a very, very important part of it. Um, I'd like to continue, but I don't want to take over. Can I? Well, I think I think. Can I just say, as a thera as a therapist, Stella, and a and a grown woman like me, I think we should all appreciate that people come at this with different experiences, and I think there's a lot of women injured by trans men who uh, decide that they're trans by autogynophiles, and so for them, obviously, the film is about many many things, but we're all very personal in our experiences, and most of our experiences. I'm sure you know, are all about projection and it's about we put onto other people what we feel about ourselves. And so obviously women who have been victims of abuse are going to watch that bit and they're going to focus on that bit because what they're hoping for in that exchange is that somebody recognises what's happened to them. And what they didn't get from that is that recognition. They didn't get any acknowledgement of their own pain and suffering. And so in the years since that, this is the first time I've ever heard you talk so candidly uh, and regretfully about that particular bit of the film and the rest of it people aren't focused on because that's the story they know existed and that's the story you told and you told it really well and you were a affable um really easy to understand people knew how you were feeling about those situations we could see your expression when you were talking to that mother or when you were talking like so compassionate when you were talking to those girls who had irreversibly harmed their bodies and you were exceptional and i guess that people do focus on that one bit because they felt really let down because you were such this impressive compassionate kind honest woman who came at this with you know, a bit of a blank slate, if you like, just your own experience. And so that's why people took it really, really personally. And they still do, because I think this is the first time I've really heard you speak of regret. And so I think that's fantastic. OK, I um, I've spoken many times about it, but I, I, I you know, I can I know lots of people don't follow my work and they certainly don't read what I've got to say. And I, I've said that about a hundred different ways. I've said exactly what I've said. So many different ways. I think I said it last week with with Sasha White, um, not Sasha on my podcast, the other Sasha. But anyway, um, I, I have said it many times, but thank you for that. I do want to say the focus of the film was trans kids. There was no focus, none of the research I was given, none of the production, the producer was amazing and the researcher was amazing. There was no focus on autogynophilia, wives, they, that was not, we had, we had a huge job and it was trans kids. And that's mm. what we wanted to blow. That was our focus. And it, you know, the, the women, it, it, I came upon it that day in that house and I went, I walked out saying medical transition shouldn't happen. The children are too devastated. This is too devastating. I had no idea about autogynophilia. And I thought that was way too devastating for that family. That was very, very harmful for that family. And, you know, I, had Debbie Hayton on the uh, Wider Lens podcast and Debbie Hayton said, you know, he said he's, that he's uh, obsessed. He became obsessed and he, he called it a pink mist. I thought it was a really good uh, phrase. Other people thought it was absolutely vile. He meant it as a kind of an absolute obsession that trampled on everybody's in the family. And I, I think that's true. Yeah, I think that's what happened. And I think it's what happens when middle-aged men go through this rabbit hole. I've seen it many times and the families get devastated, but it wasn't the focus of the film. But can I just go on yeah. to the, the conference? Um, so, um, you know, we started to organize this conference in Denver uh, six months ago and every single organization that I knew in America and many, many people in America told me not to have that conference. They told me America's not ready for a conference. That, uh, that discusses gender openly. They told me that uh, it's going to be regressive. They told me it's going to be like Kelly J's. There's going to be Antifa. There's going to be, um, uh, what are they called? Proud Boys. They said, it's a concealed weapon state. You're going to regress the movement. You're going to cause more trouble. You need to not put on this conference. That's all I got for six months. I don't think I've ever been so stressed in my life as before that conference. The, the security we put on that conference was very heavy. 
And we had, I, I thought it was three posts, but I've since been uh, corrected and it was four posts to get into the conference. So to get into the conference, you had to go through four stages. The first was a kind of a meet and greet. Then it was check your name was on the ticket, you know, the ticket list. Then it was uh, the heavy security presence where you were wanded to see if you would, uh, if you had, if you were carrying, because this was a concealed weapon state, which I think 200 people rang me to tell me that it was a concealed weapon state and I had no right to put on uh, a conference in Denver. The reason we were putting it on in Denver is to hold WPATH to account. We were doing it for any other reason. We were trying to pull down WPATH. Michael Schellenberger started the conference with a very chilling statement. You were there, Benjamin, where he said, I've never been to a conference where I had to go through such heavy security. And the entire room literally kind of, it was chilling. We all kind of went, there was a real moment in the room of Jesus Christ that was really actually very heavy. So the third post was the the wand where you checked for a concealed weapon. Then they checked your bag. Then you finally got to the fourth post where you got your wristband and you weren't allowed into that conference room without that wristband. It was a conference for adults to discuss <laughs> gender ideology and how gender um, ideology is impacting and how WPATH needs to be brought to account and how gender ideology needs to be highlighted in all its ramifications. That could be ROGD, that could be detransition, that could be autogynephilia. People spoke about all of those subjects. Parents spoke, academics spoke. This was not a therapeutic conference. It wasn't a therapeutic meeting. And an awful lot of people have a misapprehension because I'm a psychotherapist. They think Genspect is a psychotherapy, psychotherapeutic organization. It's not. Genspect has one mission, it's to promote a healthy approach to sex and gender. We do that by highlighting the problems with uh, gender ideology. We want to close WPATH, and that's what Michael Schellenberger's first talk was, how, how WPATH ends, and it was very powerful. We think that gender ideology is creating a, a really harmful impact on a, a multitude of different people, but we're not a therapeutic organization and we never have been. And so this idea, it's kind of merged that Stella's a therapist, therefore everything Genspec does should be therapeutic. It wasn't remotely therapeutic. It was actually a very good vibe, despite the very heavy security presence. It was a very good vibe in the conference. Nowhere, I don't think I breathed nearly for those three days. I was so tense. I was distracted at all times, constantly waiting for infiltration, trans activists, guns, Antifa, um, just a general kind of attack that would have really, really caused a huge amount of, of problems for, for this movement. And I, I felt the weight of responsibility because I had defied a huge amount of advice to tell me, don't put it on. Now, I've no doubt Kelly J, or Kelly, as we're now mates, um, I've noticed that um, that uh, you have been told similar, and you 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 know you're 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 indescribably brave, and I've watched you be indescribably brave, and that's what we need. You know what I mean? And I didn't know whether I'd been a brave fool. I didn't think I was being a brave fool, but I was scared that I was a brave fool, and so I was ultra, ultra on edge around trans activism, and infiltration, and a concealed weapon. So the man in the dress who, you know, he arrived. I just all I did in my in my concept of him, I barely noticed him was make sure he's behaving appropriately. He was. He did not put a step out of line. We can talk about that in a minute, but he did not. We did not get one um, email of um, complaint about Phil Illy to this day, to this moment. I'm sure we'll get many tonight, but we, we we did not receive one email. And during the conference, we didn't get one complaint about his behavior. And lots of people have checked about his behavior. Loads of people have, there's been an awful lot of conversation about his behavior since. And not one person has been able to identify even one piece of um, inappropriate behavior from him. Now, he did not, he doesn't identify as a woman. He identifies as a man. There's a few lies being said about him. He did not use breast forms. He wore a dress. He wore a dress that was a blue velvet dress. And he wore these weird arm things and leg warmers. And frankly, from 10 yards, you could see very unusual, maybe oddball is coming. And I like the straightness of that. I like the honesty of that. I like the fact that when somebody very odd is coming, that we can see it visually. I'm very well aware that people are telling me 
he was performing his fetish. That's presuming that every minute of his life is patholo pathologized, that every moment of his life is consumed by autogynophilia. I don't know the man. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. I do know that he did not uh, behave sexually in any way. He didn't use the female toilets. He used the male toilets and he wasn't a speaker. And had we stopped him and said, you can't come in or you need to wear an, uh, something else, he would have sued us and he would have won. And so I can't see what we could have done differently. I can't see how we could have said, go and wear some other clothes. And he would have said no. And where would we have been? He, he, he would have sued us and he would have won. So I, I don't understand how we can create a policy that doesn't come from Iran that would be appropriate to handle the fact that some people are very odd some people have fetishes. I know I was talking to a woman yesterday and she was telling me a man in her work had a fetish for hands and he used to leer at her hands. And we all know when a man is leering, it's kind of unmistakable, when most of us do, and she could see it. Now that's really horrible, but he wasn't leering. There was no part of a sexualized vibe from the guy. And had there been, he would have been told that's inappropriate. Now I'd say this is where we're going to disagree. I, I hear you, but I think, and we all have, this is a difference of opinion and a difference of understanding, but I have seen addicts and every single moment of their days around their addiction. And all they're thinking about is drink or heroin or whatever it is. I've seen anorexics who just live and breathe anorexia. OCD, they live and breathe it. I've also seen anorexics who are quite functioning and who don't live and breathe their, their it's, it's more low level, it's, it's more they're high functioning, it's there, but it's not consuming every moment of their day. I've seen the same with addiction and I've seen the same with depression, anxiety and various different things. There's no reason for me to think that there isn't an escalation of autogynophilia depending on the person. And so some people are just out and out fetish fetishistic, perverts, sexual deviants who are really, really, really harmful for society. He didn't behave like one of those people. Had he behaved like that, he would have been asked to leave because it would have been outside social norms. Because he wore something that couldn't be described as outside social norms, and that's where we might, you know, you know, disagree. But I just thought if he was wearing, you know, a mask, if he was wearing a nappy, we could say that's outside social norms. We cannot let you in. You have to wear something that's more approved by society. But he wasn't. He was wearing what was something that we would raise our eyebrows at. But I want to make one last point. Autogynophiles, they they are tricky at the best of times. I don't approve of much of what Phil Ilya said um, on Twitter after after the event. I was recommended his book and I was recommended his book by three people who I couldn't be closer to professionally, who I really rate and they recommended. Will I ever take the recommendations again? No, but I took the recommendations. Sometimes there's a chain of trust and you you trust that this is a strong recommendation within that book. There's something about medical tradition of children. So we shouldn't have taken it. One thing we've learned is we'll tighten up our policies around anybody recommending anything. Somebody actually emailed us a book today and she said, it's about gender. Could you put it on your website? And we said, wait, we need a team of people to read that book. God bless that poor woman. You know, so um, I want you need to more chance. You need more checks than uh, at your conference to, to put a book on these days. Yeah. Well, I just want to say this for you about autogynophilia, because they're tricky. And so imagine an autogynophile, and I would know them. And they're, some of them, it's Victoriana, and they wear these real old-fashioned, weird kind of old-fashioned, that's where they're getting their sexual kicks. Some of them are wearing elaborate, notice me, that's where they're getting their sick kicks. Some of them are wearing a t-shirt and jeans, and they're just one of the girls, and that's their autogynophilic kick. So how do we know? which just because he was wearing a blue dress that was kind of neon notice me that everybody jumped on it. What if he was wearing a t-shirt and jeans, but that was part of his autogynophilic quick kick. Where would we go with that? Would we know it? Could we open up his head and know he's leering and he's having all sorts of thoughts that were incredibly um, uh, uneasy around. I want to emphasize being in the public eye is really difficult. Sometimes people infiltrate and they create 
you're in a tricky situation. I saw you put, uh, Kelly, I saw you put a, a mic on a proud boy and he spoke at a, you know, a Let Women Speak in, in uh, Miami. I saw, you know, neo-Nazis give salutes in Melbourne. I saw you on a podcast with a guy and he was some sort of white nationalist, anti, anti-Semite and speaking with those guys, what are they called? Christ of soldiers of Christ. Never has Jen Specht ever criticized you. Never have I ever criticized you. And I know there's people who are well able to search my Twitter and search Jen Specht. We haven't done any cleanup. We have never criticized you. And I have never criticized you. Unless I might have way back in 2018, 2019, when it was much looser, I might have gone, Ugh. but it was never a criticism of your work because I think your work is brilliant. So every single time I saw Proud Boys and Neo-Nazis, I bit my lip and I thought being in the public eye, it's tricky. It's really tricky and you've got to be really sensitive around it. Not that you have to be sensitive. People have to understand that being in the public, it's just so tricky and infiltration happens. And you've got to look at mm. the spirit of what's going on. I truly think you do. And I that's why I never, I didn't jump in on any pylon about you. And I saw them. I saw what people said and I never said a word and I never yeah. would. It wouldn't, it wouldn't occur to me. Because I think I know what Kelly's doing. I know she's not trying to bring on and to do it. Neo Nazis are proud boys. They infiltrated and they took advantage. But that's also got to nothing to do with my. Work. Let me just say, Stella, because it's a nice list that you produced. But it's that is nothing to do with what I my message. Whether those whether I talk to that guy, whether I was duped into talking to that guy, whoever turns up. I do free speech events. I couldn't actually give a shit who I put a microphone on. That's nothing to do with me. It doesn't deviate from the fact that I think transitioning children is abuse, that women are adult human females, that women have a right to speak. If what I'd done with those list of examples that you just uh, rolled out, if that had gone against something that I was trying to, my my absolute core message, then I would, I would listen to that criticism and I would expect to be criticized. If, for example, I had AGPs speaking at Let Women Speak, I think that would be a, a a pretty good criticism. I just got a few things that I just want to go through. First of all, a fetish is not the same as an addiction. It's a compulsion and a perversion, and it actually has the impact to disrupt the fabric, the very fabric of every single second of a person's life. The fact that that man chose to wear a blue dress and not t shirt he could have, like you said, he could have turned up, t-shirt, jeans, had a little pair of frilly knickers underneath, Nobody would have known. He could have got his rocks off exactly the same, but he didn't choose to do that. He chose your event, which he knows to be something that I think has really fantastic, admirable, admirable goals. And um, maybe I'm wrong that you, I, I thought you were born out of a desire to stop children being medically transitioned. And so if that's your core goal, and I think it probably is, if that's your core goal, then I think that having men feeling like that's the space that they can rock up and and uh, express their fetish i think is an issue i actually think those men should be refused entry because i think it puts the more vulnerable people who get the most out of your work i think it puts them at risk um so i think that's one thing number two when we talk about debbie hayton and his pink mist i'm just wondering do you think it's right then that he teaches teenagers do you think it's right that a man who talks about Pink mist and fetish and being an autogynophile. Do you think he's it's right for him to go into school dressed in his fetish and enjoying himself? And behaving appropriately, I think would I would think a man turning up in a AGP uniform when he's a self-confessed AGP clearly enjoys some of the humiliation and attention that comes with wearing uh such outfits. I don't think that is behaving appropriately. I think that in itself is bad behavior. But I'm just, just interested from your point of view about Hayton, and I think we, we probably might differ here, and this might be a bit personal for you, but I just wondered, should AGPs be around, be teaching kids and be around people generally, when we, like you say, we don't know whether they're consistently sort of fetishizing and enjoying themselves or whether it comes and goes. And I, I actually think it probably comes more than it goes. Um, a couple of things. I just want to point out what I was saying about the autogynophile. Some autogynophiles are wearing jeans and t-shirt and that is their fetish. Mm. Uh, yeah. I, I just want to highlight that We don't that know point. that, do we? 
That's what. Yeah. The, that's and, the point. That if you do exactly. that, if they do, if that is their fetish, right, and it's it's not detectable, then it's not. And people are, you know, I'm sure all the time we are involved in situations that we don't consent to. All the time. I don't know whether the man who serves me in Tesco's has got a fetish about short women with blonde hair, right? I don't know that. But we do know about this particular person and he was a great, you know, he, he chose the outfit on purpose to, to sort of advertise or be consistent with his AGP brand. And so I think at that point, we are being invited in. We're being invited in to comment. We're being invited to feel uncomfortable. Um, and it's, you know, I wear certain clothes because I want to deliver a message. He definitely did that that day. Yeah. No, you make very good points. And when I first um, uh, was interviewed, it was about this time five years ago, about gender, I was being interviewed by a journalist who knew my work because I'd already written about mental health for a long time. And he was on my side and he didn't know anything about gender. And I told him about autogynephilia. And he was very in earnest and he went off and studied because, you know, the way these journalists, they go off and check it all out. And he had never heard of autogynephilia. And he said, Stella, I, I hear everything you're saying about the kids and all that. But actually, I can't get that thing in about autogynephilia because it's completely dis disputed. It's not a recognized uh, condition. La, la, la. Now, I was really educated by this point. I'm a year into it. So I knew my stuff. And I said, it's in the DSM. It's been there for 30 years. There's been a massive campaign to, 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 to kill this condition. It exists. And it's frankly ver very similar to some other fetishes that are causing huge harm to society. And he fought back and he did not put it in. And I'll never forget that awful feeling of he, he was on my side and he wouldn't uh, publish it. And it reminds me in the 1980s, my mother, believe it or not, she was very innocent and she was 40 when she first heard about lesbianism. But she didn't know what <laughs> paedophilia was. I know. <laughs> I don't know where I came from. But um, she didn't know what paedophilia was in the early 80s. She knew there was bad men. But she thought they were violent to children. She didn't actually know there was a sexual issue about bad men. And I just think how vulnerable we must have been as children that my own mother didn't actually know what a paedophile was and didn't know that this was something to be aware of. There was a huge campaign of public awareness, which is very much what Genspec tries to do. One of our main goals is a public awareness campaign about ROGD, detransition, autogynephilia, parent story, all the other issues. Um, exploratory blah blah so um we need a public awareness campaign about autogynephilia so that by the mid 80s or late 80s my mother knew well what paedophilia is just like many many other mothers all over ireland and god knows where else they figured out what paedophilia was and they really changed their behavior around certain small section of men who were suddenly seen in a completely different set of eyes. When I figured out what autogynephilia was, like I say, it was a moment in the kitchen where I went bang, 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 bang. Oh my God, I get it. And all the ramifications came to me. So I, I remember telling a woman at a talk and she was telling me about this lovely trans woman who was you know, coming to visit her every week. And I explained about autogynephilia and I saw her face go, oh, make a perfect circle, perfect circle with her mouth that she realized what was going down. And so I believe that uh, we need a public awareness campaign about autogynephilia. So I can see the women who are very attached to the Let Women Speak movement. They hate me saying this. They think I'm normalizing it. I'm like normalizing it. I'm highlighting it like we highlighted paedophilia. It's the most important. But he was normalized, though. That, but he was normalized, wasn't he? He was like celebrated. And he's like, oh, he's an AGP, but he's kind of an auto heterosexual. And, and I think I think. Look, I believe you. I believe that you, what you want to do is you want to eradicate it and you want to help uh, stopping children transition. I believe you, but I, I just don't think, I just don't think it's coherent messaging. If actually these men feel welcome at Genspect and they would, you know, he was tweeted about. There's, there's obviously a, a culture that doesn't oh, yeah. see these men as particularly terrible, um, and that it's not, you know, it, it's a, it's a perversion and i i just think I, what i would like from this is that there is a, a period of reflection where 
if your focus as Jen spoke, like my focus as women, I don't think anyone's ever not clear about exactly what I think and exactly what my focus is with Let Women Speak, right? And that's why some people like it, some people don't. Some people don't even like me, but like the Let Women Speak movement because they're very clear about exactly what it is. So I, from an outside point of view, if I was advising Jen Specht, and I'll give it to you for free, I would say if you could just hone in on those kids and those families, which I think you are miraculously uh, just offering something that nobody else is, and I know there's sort of sporadic therapists here, there, and everywhere. But if that message was really coherent and focused, and we and you just got rid of these AGPs who are looking for something, like they're narcissistic, they've probably got BPD, they're looking for other things, they're looking for, to steal some of your attention. Uh, and yeah. that's exactly what Phil did at your event. Then I think if you could be really firm in that they are not welcome, because actually what... What are they good for? What is an AGP good for at an event where there are some parents that are struggling with their kids wanting to transition? Some of their kids will be in their late teens, probably are AGPs. I, I just don't see how those two people attending that one event actually marries at all. And I do think you can choose who comes to your event. You could have a dress code or whatever. And you would get into actually men, please don't come. If you're, if you're an AGP, can you just not bring it openly so you make other, or, or they get asked to leave? Because if a man turned up at my event in a dress, tried to get, like, when we're open air, there's nothing I can do. But coming into the pub after, if one of the AGPs that occasionally is brave enough to stand on the periphery tried to come into the pub, I would just say, no, you're not welcome. Yeah. And that's your, not only your prerogative, it's it's your your, you know, your goal, this is where you're at and this is where you're brilliant. And I'm glad you are. I really am. I really commend it. I think what Lemons, Let Women Speak as a campaign has been phenomenal. And I'm glad you have been phenomenal because it's been needed. I think our campaign, which is to raise awareness for autogynephilia, OROGD, detransition and all the other aspects of gender ideology, it's equally important. Like I say, the campaign to raise awareness for paedophilia in Ireland worked. By the end of the 80s, everybody knew what a paedophile was. By the start of the 80s, they didn't. We need a similar campaign about autogynephilia. So few people know what autogynephilia. That journalist not knowing, not putting, he was on my side and not putting it into the article. It was a chilling moment of me realizing we need a proper campaign. There's very, very few books about autogynephilia. You know, Michael Bailey, it's impossible to buy Michael Bailey's book. And I know lots of people have problem with it. I don't care what I want. I know I, I don't care about people disagreeing. What I want is the issue of autogynephilia raised and raised again and raised again and raised again to the point what that women say does? It What do you think that achieves? Like, it will achieve its that, that has a similar status as being a flasher, paedophilia, frotterism, uh, peeping tom, voyeurism. That people know what a voyeur is. They know what somebody does on a train when they rub up against you. Is they know these people exist. We need the same awareness about autogynephilia that we have as ped paedophilia. We need the same awareness for autogynephilia as flashers, peeping toms. They're all the paraphilias. It's the only ones that's been successfully suppressed. And it's vital that your average woman knows about it. And we're just... And do you we're not managing to get it out beyond our echo chamber, I believe. But do you think when you, when you have shown sympathy and understanding, and maybe it's a misinterpretation, but I think if loads of people are supposedly misinterpreting you, then the problem is the message as opposed to the people receiving it. So if loads of people think that you have great sympathy for AGPs, and actually what you're trying to do is tell warn people about AGPs, the kind of the, that tweet and the defense after the tweet. And then some women, you know, some women have come to me and said, I can't speak at your event because I've told I've got to come out and I've got to defend Genspect, which you might want to answer that because that's kind of the, the rumors. And so maybe you would like to address that. I think you probably should. <laughs> I think you probably should. Um, well, well, so, what is that? You know, that, I know about this well, that, that, you have, that you have asked people to publicly uh, defend you and celebrate Genspect on the base on the back of the criticisms. So if you were, if you want, oh, I, no. I think it would be. 
no. Yeah. Okay. That that's not true. What I did say, um, somewhere in the midst of the last few weeks, um, I emailed people who I had to email about the, basically the speakers, only the speakers of the event. If you um, if you enjoyed the conference, we'd appreciate if you mentioned it online. That's it. That's okay. full start. I, you know, no more to that. And yeah, I, I made no defense. And it was very much if you enjoyed the conference, if you found value in the conference. I it didn't say, Jesus Christ, I don't do that. I don't live like that. But I do want to say something that you said about my incoherent message. Um, I'm going to think about it, but I'm going to just offer a couple of points. You know, I am going to, I know that will resonate and I know I'm going to chew that over, you know what I mean? Because in the, you know, after this conversation, but I just want to put a couple of points to that. The fact I'm a psychotherapist has muddied what Genspect is. People presume it's a therapeutic organization. And I didn't really realize that until these last few weeks where everybody kept on saying it was a therapeutic meeting. It was a meeting for vulnerable people. I was like, what? What the hell? No, it wasn't. Not even a tiny bit. It was a, a meeting to hold WPAT to account. It was a meeting to highlight the problems with gender ideology. It wasn't at all. Nowhere near. Nothing to do with therapeutic. Just because I'm a therapist. So you're a lobby group. Therapeutic. Are you a lot? I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. So are you uh, a lobby group? What are, what are, what is Genspect if it's not therapeutic? You're a lobby group. It's not therapeutic. It's not therapeutic at no, all. No, I know. It's I'm just saying you just group. said that. Yeah. It's an advocacy group. It's it's an advocacy group. Yeah. So yeah, we do lobby okay. and we definitely do educational resources. We try to run public awareness campaigns. We do offer guidance because we happen to, you know, obviously I know more therapists than I know most people. So we offer a lot of guidance for schools, guidance for clinicians. We have a small section of Genspec, which is beyond trans, which by the way, provides funding for people who've been harmed by medical transition. We don't have, there's no such thing as a Genspec therapist. There's no such thing as a beyond trans therapist. We provide funding for anybody who wants to get therapy. They get the therapy from the list. It's nothing to do with us. We are not employing them. And we provide the funding for the therapy for people who've been harmed by medical transition. That's, that's, that's not therapeutic. That's providing funding. And that's the yes. only thing that you could yeah. arguably say. But um, there was something I wanted to say. There's so many things I wanted to say. There was something important, though. Uh, I can't remember. Oh, you started talking know. about uh, what, that you're not a therapeutic and you realise that lots of people thought that you're therapeutic. That's, and then I interrupted to say, are oh, you a lot? So sorry. Yeah. Yeah, no, we're, we're, we're not. And I, I did learn from that. Oh, I know. It's the famous, and you were right to bring it up. And I'm glad. Imagine if we had this conversation, we hadn't brought it up. The tweet of the guy in the dress, uh, the, the recommendation, you know, check this book out. So as soon as this photo was taken, we very much pride ourselves in being transparent and honest and forthright. And that, and I want to go back to my incoherent message, and that was the thing I wanted to go back to. But let's go for this first. So, um, and I'm not calling it incoherent messaging. I want to push back on that. But I want to go back onto this photo. So, as soon as the photo was taken, immediately had anybody tried on the social media team to say suppress that photo, don't put it out, we'll be shot. Because frankly, if I had I seen that photo, I would have said we're going to get shot for that. Shot, hung down, and quartered. That would have been my immediate response. But I didn't see the photo. Of course I didn't. I wasn't anywhere near it. I was running around, wringing my hands, looking for people in concealed weapons. And I'm sure you saw me, Ben. I, I, I was distracted at all points in those three days. Just, hi, how's it going? Are you enjoying yourself? It was very, very intense those few days. It was brilliant. In fairness, I think everybody really had a good time. Not everybody, but most people did. But um, so I would have think it would have been really rotten of Jen Speck to suppress the photo because we would get pushed back. It just does not. It feels like a dishonest act that shouldn't have happened. I don't think it was a well worded tweet. I do think that the person who wrote the tweet is phenomenal, is brilliant, has been an amazing tweeter for so long. And I wouldn't even dream of saying anything uh, negative about her because she's a brilliant. She's just a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant person who's amazing and almost, you know, was crying for two weeks out of feeling awful about that tweet. You know, when we have done 32,000 tweets and a few of your tweets are wrong, I, I would urge people look at the tweets before, look at the tweets after, 
look the spirit of the occasion. Yeah, it wasn't a great tweet. It wasn't a great tweet. It, you know, it, it should have been autophagynophilia is a very difficult condition that causes a huge amount of harm in society and needs an awful lot of awareness. Something like that should have been said. Instead, it was kind of trite and check this out, clearly thinking of something completely different, which is um, uh, a kind of we are open, we are transparent, people were here and they were coming to our conference. I think that's unfortunate and I think it's uh, definitely caused an awful lot of offence. However, I think the, the extraordinary pylon disregarded the tweets before and after and the body of tweets and the number of tweets that came out of that conference that consistently pu pulled down gender ideology consistently was very, very good. One tweet out of thousands of tweets I think it's inappropriate to highlight that tweet. It felt very uh, bad faith. Highlight that tweet, go on and on about that tweet. And, you know, we, we were frozen because it was just so devastating because so many thousands of people were coming at us. And we kept on thinking things like, well, we would have been mad to suppress the photo. That would have been dishonest and inappropriate. It wasn't saying, isn't Phil great? It was spotted. Phil, autogynophilia, the point being, autogynophilia is something that we need to know about. He's written a book. There's three books that I know about of autogynophilia. Mike Bailey's, which is impossible to get, and Lawrence, which is impossible to read, and <laughs> Phil's, which is frankly a little bit off the wall. But the fact is, there's very little. That journalist all those years ago had nothing to refer to with autogynophilia. It's been very successfully suppressed. Need mm -hmm. need of books. We, you know what I mean? When the first paedophiles came out, when the first stories came out, we need them again and again and again. And if anything good has come out, maybe many people heard about autogynophilia over the last couple of weeks. Maybe that came out. There was the other thing I want to talk about it was the message. I do want to take you up on that message. And I know I'm talking about two different things, so we can you can sort me out about that in a second. But about the what you call the incoherent message, I genuinely truly believe that there has been a very dark smear campaign against me by supporters of you, definitely Grace O'Malley and certainly Grace O'Malley's pals. She would definitely and take exception to that. Like, I, I, I just want to say, very, oh, I mean, that's who, I, sorry, can I, please can I answer? As a, that's she's not a supporter of me. She's, a, she's an independent woman who knew about this fight probably before I did. So she's, I just want to say that, it, I feel it's a little bit cheap saying supporters of you because okay. I think people I independently I took issue. I was told she was a great friend of yours <laughs> and I was like, really? <laughs> and I kind of went off on one about that. But um, yeah, the, the, certainly Grace O'Malley and certainly other people, I'm not saying they're supporters of you. I am definitely saying there has been a very determined smear campaign from the day that film came out to vilify me and misrepresent me. So they, they say certain lines. One is Stella's trying to trans children. I, I, it's wrong. I, I heard you. I was so pleased when you said that. I was so pleased you said earlier on that, you know, yeah, definitely. Jen Speck's main issue is to pull down gender ideology and to offer a healthy approach to sex and gender. My personal issue, stop child medical transition. I think it's, 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 it's just awful and needs to be stopped. Um, so, you know, there is a slight difference and of course there would be. Um, but um, that smear campaign has mi misrepresented me, said that I believe in true trans a thousand million times I've addressed it by writing, by video, by podcast. <laughs> I've got about 85 different articles saying this is why I don't believe in true trans. I never believed in true trans because I had my own weird experience as a kid. I had an understanding of gender that other people don't have. I, I really got it from a very young age. So I met a trans person at a teenage years and I knew where they were coming from. Not autogynophilia, but trans and that kind of fixation. I knew where it was and I did not think it was anything to do with true trans. Never believed it, never have. So medical transition to children, rubbish. True trans, rubbish. Paedophile enabler, not only rubbish, but scurrilous and very dark. And uh, some sort of weird AGP panderer, I don't know. Anyway, that smear campaign has been devastating. And that's how I, I opened this uh, conversation. 
which may I say is going so much better. And I'm so, so thankful that you've come in good faith. I really, from the bottom of my heart, because I didn't think you would, and I'm thrilled that you have. But um, that that campaign is, it has misrepresented me and has caused me huge amount of pain because what happens is I answer back and then I get misquoted by trans activists in other contexts because I'm answering back to those people who are agents of chaos and destruction and they are trying to put about things. So everybody said, don't explain, just let your work reveal it. So I didn't explain. I kept on letting my work reveal it. It was bad advice and I shouldn't have done it. And now it's five years later. And I said, yeah, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to be very uncomfortable for everybody because I'm going to push back and say, I'm not taking this anymore. Everybody would prefer me to zip it, take it. And then they could happily just roll along, liking you, liking me, liking everything and hope they still can. But that's I suddenly said, nah, I, 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 I'm, I'm fighting back. The misrepresentation of me has gone on for too long. And it's people within a technically our own movement, but they are really, really awful people. And I, I think that's nothing to do with an incoherent message and everything to do with a very definite smear campaign. And I think there is a difference. We could be, you know, we could agree to disagree on that. Well, I, look, I just, I just think this particular man and, and a, a culture in which that tweet can be made. And, 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 and I, I hate to call it, it, it's not really about a tweet. It's, a, it's about uh, a lack of understanding or a lack of uh, messaging around the fact that this is, you know, you talk about wanting everyone to learn about an AGP, I th about autogynephilia, and I, I bloody well hope you succeed in that also. But I think just the culture in which that tweet could be made is is maybe questionable. So uh, I, I think that's what I'm talking about um, with incoherence. And I think, look, we are, we are both in whatever position we're in, you're doing your job, I'm doing my job on the basis that we have seen our society being gaslit, coerced and manipulated. And so I think the heightened awareness around that, people are very twitchy, that especially when somebody like yourself comes along and, you know, you look like you're going to save the day. And I don't just mean you, there's many of us. And that's why I think people get so disappointed. I really do feel very disappointed when something like that, Phil, illy tweet. Um, I just I just want to revisit because I'm just very interested in 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 how you would answer this and it's not it's it's not really a gotcha I just wonder about the AGP the AGPs around kids in schools now that you're learning about AGP would that be something that Genspec would take a position on that that actually a fetish is kind of quite consuming and and you know that there's a broad range of fetish and do you actually think, as an organisation, that you would advocate for people with fetishes maybe not to be around kids in schools? Yeah, I think it's a really uh, good question. I think sometimes I'm not going to say exactly um, everything that I think because trans activists will take it and use it against me and it will be reported mm -hmm. in the mainstream media. I think people with fetishes should not be around children. I think that's without a doubt something very clear that I want to say. They shouldn't be around children and there needs to be a public, public awareness campaign about this particular fetish that has been successfully, um, mm. you know, hidden. So autogynephilia being the one. So that needs a public awareness campaign. So then people will very quickly realize this is inappropriate around children. But I yeah. think that is something that needs to be worked towards. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yes. Very yeah. Good. Me too. Me too. Now, I'm. I'm. I must say, I'm really pleased that we've had this conversation because I really like admire you and and like you as a person. I think that you've done some extraordinary things, Stella. And I just, I think these other little things just have had the capacity to damage some of the things that you've done and I'd, I'd really like there to be no flies on you because if anyone's going to take out WPATH uh, you've got the best chance and so I really hope that you felt this has been a lovely conversation in which we've we've aired some truly magnificent stuff but we've both I do. you know you've both gained I, I really do
I'm I'm really relieved. I was tense all day. I'm just so pleased that we were you let women speak, may I say. <laughs> Do exactly what it says in the tin. We didn't let the man speak, but sure will him. That's fine. No, I was pleased about that because I thought well. he'd do this. Yeah, he was He was going to do his, like, quiet, reasonable, creepy, apparently. <laughs> quite reasonable, creepy man. Ouch, I'm not that creepy, but teach their own. <laughs> it's a totally subjective <laughs> thing. Um, but can, can I ask a couple of questions? Um, one, what would GenSpec do with D-trans males or men who transitioned and then uh, have all these implants, have all the surgeries? Should they... How is there a dress code? Is that what would be appropriate for? Because in the in the photo in the photo yeah. of Phil, there's actually yeah. a, a post-op trans man who is actually suing the people who um, transitioned oh, yeah. them. Um, but nobody nobody saw that because they they so-called yeah. pass. So what what is the uh, going forward with people who have transitioned and then like s figure out why they transitioned? And then go through the process of detransitioning. You can't really detransition after a certain point. It would, it would look it would look more um, off putting had that trans individual tried to be try to appear like a man because they've gone so far in this other direction. So that, and then also, does it come down to dress codes, or is that just missing the point? Like, how do we draw a line on the intention behind? people's clothing and and does it not result ultimately in sex-based um dress codes and yeah. and if not then how do we do we do we go that is that where we're we going and and on what basis do we make those claims and enforce that who's it do you want to answer about your own organization stella uh well i i don't know because maybe you might add something in here i don't know i have plenty to say obviously but go on I'll just be brief. Right. So for me, I think that there's been a little bit of trite commentary from your good self, Ben, about what um, what is appropriate for these men to wear. And I think we all bloody well know what's appropriate, which is why most people adhere to some sort of social norm on dress codes. So whilst you look very fetching in the little video thumbnail, Yes, for this chat <laughs> for this chat that would be entirely inappropriate like i'm just sort of thinking if you go to a conference what would i expect people to wear really i'd probably expect them to wear business attire and i think maybe w path maybe they do invite loads of trans activists and it's a big cheerleading aren't we great for slicing off your breasts but maybe as gen Spec <coughs> grows and becomes uh, a global advocacy group for kind of a, a, a grown-up conversation about gender and gender identity. And I hate both of those terms because I, I don't believe in the word gender. But as we sort of move forward, I would hope that maybe it wasn't such a place for sort of service users, if you like, to attend. But actually, it would be more about the people that are going to solve this shit rather than, uh, you know, and maybe you have workshops for detransitioners and you have other sorts of things that are for certain people. But I'm just wondering if I went to a global cancer uh, conference uh, to try and cure cancer, am I finding loads of cancer patients there? Possibly, possibly not. I mean, I, I don't know that, but, but possibly not. So maybe it, there's always going to be a, a, a weird dodgy like can you really talk about the the whole thing about detransitioners and about transition and about some of the narcissism comes along with it and some of the uncomfortable stuff that comes along with it if you've actually got detransitioners in the room potentially not potentially that's that's a, a conversation for a different place but when it comes to dress codes i just think business attire and i think we all know you know that that the supposed passing uh, man, um, I don't think, were there women dressed like that? Were there actual women dressed in skin tight, bigger hugging, nightclub sort of attire? Probably not. So I think just we can keep eroding social norms and pretending they're not important, but actually I think they are proving more and more important on a daily basis. And I don't mean that I want everybody to dress really conservatively, but I, I do think that we are losing 
some of our fundamentals, which are sort of these unwritten rules and social contracts that we have. And maybe it's about time that maybe there is a dress code. Business attire would be the dress code. Um, yeah, I'm glad I got you to answer first because I'm, I think it's our job to reflect on what's just happened, Jen Speck's job, you know what I mean, to kind of have a, have a think because what has happened has been pretty devastating. Like, it was an amazing conference. It really was. And, you know, the footage of it, I think, that will come out will show that it, it was very, very powerful and there was so much really, really important stuff raised and it's got completely, you know, um, you know, distracted by 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 this, you know, awful event. So you might be right. My my feeling is, our focus in Genspect is we were providing a, a non medicalized approach to gender distress. That's our big focus. We want to highlight the issues around gender ideology. We want to hold WPATH to account. We want to close WPATH because we think it's a it's a it's a very harmful organization. That's our focus. We part of our gender framework is a non-medicalized approach to gender and a very definitive, clear way to show how we can protect single sex spaces, sports, prisons, you know, all the all the um issues that we're very aware of about sports and toilets and refuges and prisons that's where our focus is and i suppose every organization has to figure out where are they going to actually focus because if you try to be all things to all men you'll fail or all women let women speak knows what they're doing and they're doing it very well you know we're i think we're doing what we're doing very well which is highlighting the risks of gender ideology and offering resolution with a non-medicalized approach to gender with the gender framework which we were so excited to uh, launch we were like quivering with excitement and it's barely been looked at thank you to the few people that have looked at it because i fell over myself thanking them so thank you for reading our gender framework because it's very long but um so yeah w we have not covered something that maybe let women speak could be brilliant at covering which is exactly what you just spoke about which is social norms protecting the the reason for social norms protecting the reason for need for dress code protecting and giving dignity to the argument of dress codes and social norms are there they've been created for th over thousands of years and we need to defend the existence of them without being mocked and arguably i think let women speak could do it very well i think gen Spect has enough on its on its on its hands with what <laughs> do and i think if we get into that because of the odd all oddball who comes i i don't know about that uh, when i when you said about the cancer conference i thought i don't know some enthusiasts would come i know they would you know what i mean there was an awful lot of academics there was an awful lot of clinicians there was people like benjamin there was there was just a very wide array of people and it, it felt very good because I'd say most people disagreed with each other. Parents disagree with detransitioners, Academ academics disagree with the 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 whatever, the the feminists. The philosophers were there <laughs> given their philosophy. It was a, definitely a wide tent where lots of people disagreed. I, I don't know, but I really truly believe that it's it's very important that we 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 go for our focus. And we let other people go for a focus. And I think you will do it very well. And I'm not necessarily disagreeing. I think we need to reflect on it. But I'm not attracted towards dress codes. Um, it's not where my strength is because I don't believe in them. But that doesn't mean I'm right. And it doesn't mean that I am ready to negate your work. I've never done anything except support it. And nor has Genspect. We've always supported your work. Well, I hope you appreciate that I come from a place of wanting uh, everything sounds patronizing, but I want it. I, I, I want you to replace WPATH. And I, I also think that the people most injured by this are children who have irreversible damage and anything that either one of us can do to prevent another child, even socially transitioning, I yeah. think is, uh, totally. is a, it's something that we both want more than anything because we know that there's no coming back from there's no growing back breasts that have been lopped off right there's this and you meet more detransition detransitioners than i do so that's one of the things and the other people i as you rightly pointed out with the debbie hayton interview 
the families and the women are so damaged and traumatized and children of these AGPs, um, I think are often completely ignored also. And totally. so I think, I think that those people have to be because they are the most injured. Those people have to be centered in the things that we do. Now I choose to focus on women's rights, but if there are detransitioners in amongst, I, I, like, I think that my stuff benefits females especially who have transitioned because it it gives them i mean they come it's not many feminists that attend let women speak but what it does is it offers a community of women and then those women are welcomed back into the fold of women and then i think that's just you know the the, the benefit of that is extraordinary and it's life-affirming stuff to see to see the tension just evaporate from a, a woman's face who's had you know crappy testosterone had a breast removed and you see her back and she's she's just fitting right into a group of yeah. old young whatever women it's amazing um but i but i just think that if if we try and maintain a, a focus of those most vulnerable don't necessarily shape everything that we do but they are permanently considered then i don't think we can go too wrong any other questions ben <laughs> me um uh, what are you guys having for thanksgiving oh can, can, can i just say one thing before we go on to that <laughs> wait 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 the detransitioner who has passed the point of no return you know some detransitioners they very understandably just say stop no more interventions i'm not going to have a mastectomy i'm a man I was born a man. I now look like a woman, but I'm not having any more surgical interventions because every decision I've made in the last 10 years has been wrong. And I'm scared of my decision making process and I'm scared of everything. I think we are going to have a really tricky time over the next 10 years or 15 years of very androgynous people, whether they're male to female, you know, the, the ability male to female with breasts, uh, that's one. But more so, I would argue the female to male. And I think you're right about the certain there's a, you've created an energy for women that is really special. And I'm really glad you have created it, Kelly. But uh, and I think it is very special. But the um, the female to male where testosterone is a beast. And I've met so many detransitioners and they look so male. And they will be in female toilets because they will be detransitioners. And they are having a very hard time coming back. And I don't know how dress codes and how people can handle this. I, I don't know what's coming, but I've met so many detransitioners, more than most people. I'm like, whoa, 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 how are we going to do this? Anyway, we're not doing detransitioners. We're not doing Thanksgiving. We're Irish. I don't know if Kelly is. No, we don't do Thanksgiving. I'm just, I'm just thankful. Uh, I'm very thankful for this. So uh, thank yeah. you, Ben, uh, no. for giving up your... I'm much more thankful to you, Kelly, because, you know, you could have come at this so many different ways. And I, I'm just so glad that we just had this conversation because I just think it was actually really productive for yeah. the movement as a larger body. I really think something lovely could come from that. Lovely. Well, look, I think I owe I I I think I owe your work uh, that the direct questions that means that you can yeah. you can address them yeah. i think it i think everybody benefits from clear and direct and uh you know i i think we all benefit from that because we all want thing, you to you know even the women that are you know very rapidly critical i'm sure they want you to succeed because the we worst all thing want is an end to it hang. sorry i'm talking over you the worst thing i did was just not take it on i should have took it on years ago as a dope you know I, I just kept on thinking just my work will show itself and you very definitely said it's incoherent and i'm like shit <laughs> you know you know what i mean i'm gonna think about that you know what i mean like because i certainly am incoherent i'm articulate but i believe i didn't fight back when i should have i think it's not even fighting back sometimes it's just a if if loads of people have a, like i couldn't give a shit about people accusing me of being far right or anything there's just no it's nothing to do with my work i'm not far right i don't need to go out of my way to convince anybody if they want to believe it i don't i really don't care i don't care about all the other accusations but if someone said that i wasn't centering women 
I might address those things. And I might not address it to those people. I might not give them the satisfaction of addressing it. But maybe if it was people that were looking to me for, oh, I'm doing a politician thing. That's so awful. Yeah. Um, maybe, I don't know. I've just started doing it because I've started, I've been talking to my kids about how it's a really terrible thing to do. And now I keep doing it. Uh, it's all psychosomatic. Um, but I, th I think if, if your goal is one thing and people keep thinking your goal is something else, then I do think that it's, it's in your own interests not to satisfy them. Never like they're not, you're not working for those people. It's not their futures that you are working for at all. It's, it's families and it's detransitioners and it's, it's kids that are potential uh, kind of for the, the medical harm. So I do think in that respect, it's always worth ensuring that people know exactly what you're about. But anyway, I'm delighted that we had this yeah. conversation. Um, and uh, thank you, Ben. And thank happy you Thanksgiving to all you lovely Americans. So, yeah. so wonderful to have you both. Um, I will put this on my Spotify and you're both free to republish this on your channels too. And links to your work will be Thanks. down there in the description. Thank you very much for your evening. Thank you. Thanks so much. Have a great one. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.